Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Nick Demet. I'm one of the founders of the Board of Innovation. And as a test, we're an international innovation office and we create remarkable business models. That's, in short, what we do. Um, I'm from Belgium. We're, uh, we have our office in, uh, in Antwerp. That's 40 kilometers just above uh, Brussels. Uh, we have a f we're a quite international office, meaning okay, at, at our office itself, we're just with three or four people now. Uh, but we're uh, more or less like a network organization, meaning we also have a few of our uh, embassies. Embassies are independent people working for us, working together with us on business projects. Like uh, for uh, we have one in Kyoto, one in Cairo, somebody in Seattle, and that really helps us out to find very good local expertise. Like when we're doing some studies on, on Kickstarter, it's good to have somebody in Seattle that knows the local context. When we're doing something on gaming, it's very useful that we have somebody in, in Kyoto or in Tokyo that could help us to point to the, to the very good local cases and so on. So that's more or less uh, where we are. And our, our key focus, the main thing that we do uh, for all our clients and the projects that we're do, working for, uh, it's, it's we help them to find new ways to make money. That's, that's the key goal, finding ways to make money. And as I uh, was listening to, during this panel, it's more or less like the, you have doing all this art stuff or developing stuff and then let somebody else take care of the money part. That's not the way to do it, of course. Um, we're the two founders and if you look at our, our company and our background, uh, I have a mixed background. Uh, I did some computer sciences at a university in, uh, in uh, Belgium um, that didn't, well, didn't went, work it out. So after a year, I switched. I did uh, industrial design. So I'm basically an industrial designer, meaning I, I can talk with you on plastics, mechanics, uh, economics, all sorts of things that you teach in industrial design. And after that, I did uh, innovation management, focusing more on the business side, going more in-depth on the economic side. That's where I, where I met Philip. So I know pretty hard, uh, afterwards I also worked as an industrial designer and an innovation consultant. So I know pretty well the feeling of, okay, you're a designer, you can, you can create great stuff, you're awesome, uh, you, can, you can sketch everything, you can work it out to make it happen, but okay, the business side, that's for somebody else. And if you talk with very uh, people that are, are, are focusing more on the design side, saying the, the form, and the, 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 the touch and the feeling of a product, that most of the time those are not people that are interested uh, to talk with an accountant, to talk with a lawyer, to talk with a client even on what do you need exactly, how much are you willing to pay for my product. Uh, talking about money is sometimes even a dirty word. You don't talk about money when you're more the creative person. That's somebody else's problem. So I don't believe in that and I'm, uh, I think you, we all need to be more entrepreneurial. If you want to uh, create a product, a creative product, whatever, you need to understand the business you're operating in. You need, your ecos you need to understand your ecosystem and so on to actually um, make sure that, that your clients or the people you're working with do make money with your, the thing that you made and actually it will help you uh, on the long run. At this moment, many companies are hiring designers. Design thinking is quite hot in the industry. You see that many companies are looking for creative people to, to join their boards, to join their management teams, to say, okay, how are things working out here? What do you do? Designers have some kind of a process. They look to problems in a different way. And I'm pretty sure that in, in a few years' time, those same people will not, will not just looking for designers, they're looking for game designers. So also in our company, we're already looking for maybe to hire some kind of... Uh, uh, a game developer or people that, have, that understand game mechanics, storytelling, uh, what drives motivations for people, and so on. So I'm pretty sure that uh, hiring a game designer will be quite common in a few days, but then you need to understand a little bit more about business and how things are working in a business context for a company. Just, just to say that. What do we do with, with our company? So you know what's, what's, what we're doing. Um, Question to you, who, have touch, who has touched this, this object last year? Is there anybody? Hands? Okay, a few of you. Who has touched this object? Two, three. Basically what you're seeing in this, in this industry, and it's not only in this industry, uh, you, s you see a huge shift going on. You have, uh, in this case, 
uh, the, the print industry, whatever, and this, this print industry is moving to a new digital era, meaning that big publishers like uh, big producers that make these magazines like IKEA, they start with these uh, magazines, now shifting to iPad. This, has a, this creates a lot of problems for two different parties. At one side, we have the, a big corporate, like one of our clients is one of the top producers in paper worldwide, starting with forests, creating pulp, creating paper, for iPhone packaging and IKEA catalogs and so on. If you're in this business, you're in a, in a tough situation, of course, because all this, this market is going to digital. That's a hard thing to do. Another type of our clients are the more startups, new ventures. Uh, they see this as an opportunity. Okay, uh, we, we want to do something in this, in this trend. We want to create an, some kind of an, uh, uh, this type of uh, interior catalog on iPad using augmented reality using new technology, but how to monetize this. So it's the same type of question, how to, mon how to make money in the future. But on one side, if you work together with a startup, a new venture, that's a, a different way of working than working together with an innovation team of a huge multinational. But the at the end, it's the same challenge, and that's what we are trying to help people with. So that's basically it. So yes, the game industry is also evolving. Things are going quite fast here. There's a huge shift going on from, from the classic model to these new models where you're, enter you're entering now. You're going to uh, be more entrepreneurial yourself. You have to know where is the money and how do I generate money myself? How do I become more entrepreneurial in my field? And I want to show you some cases and inspiration so actually you, you'll understand, okay, where is the money? And uh, maybe trigger one, pe one person in your team that say, okay, in the future, I will focus more on this business side. I will take care of this, I will follow new sources, I will work on this, and I will take a close eye on, okay, how can we make money with this thing? Not purely focusing on the product, but more on the bigger context around it. What is this? You can shout. Of course, jukebox. Um, you always try to look for similar industries. Look how they evolved, what were the experiments in this case, uh, how did it work out? Did somebody pick it up? Did do something new with it? And could we actually learn something from them? So if you look at the music industry or any other industry, uh, industries, you always find remarkable cases over there. And it started with, of course, with the jukebox, and then we had kind of a similar thing. I, there are a few of, of these outside. And basically, the business model behind this thing was straightforward, of course, uh, a pay-per-use model. Every time you want to play a game, you, need to, you have to pay this thing, you have to pay the jukebox, or you have to put a coin um, in these arcade games. And in the end, you were paying 10 or $20 an hour if you're quite a, uh, a heavy person. But if you could make a game that, that uh, would actually make $10 an hour, that, that was a very strong case at that time. Today, if you make four cents at, on average a day with one gamer, that's already a pretty good game. Sometimes it goes up to 10 cents per user per day, but then you're, you're really in, 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 a, in a top league there. So look at these similar industries, look how they work, and try to understand what, what drives them. This is, of course, old stuff, pay-per-use model in the music industry, pay-per-use model in the gaming industry. Uh, let me just open it up. That's, that's old stuff, but even there, if you look at um, this, this model, it's still people are, are looking at it and trying trying to experiment with that. There are uh, similar concepts popping up, doing uh, things like this. They try to copy an outdated model. It's pocket change. Anybody used this before? Nobody. They're trying to do the same thing. OK, every time you want to play a game on mobile, on Facebook, on a new platform, they try to introduce a new concept. OK, we're not going with ads. We want to do the same thing all over again uh, and ask people some money for that. Who thinks this has any chance on survival, these things? Anybody? I don't think, indeed, that, they, uh, that this could work out in the end. I think it's an outdated model. But it's very important to keep a close eye on, on these things. Uh, you will see that every time, when you look at an industry, a business model experiment exists for a few years. It might evolve over time to the most dominant model in that industry, but it will never fade away. There are always people that will take this model 
and to see what can what can we do with it. Maybe we can you know, make a small twist with it and do something useful for a very specific niche. And if you're in that niche, you might make some money with it. If you look at all these indie games and uh, you have very talented teams, it might be that one of those teams decides, okay, this is we have a new approach, a new type of game, and maybe for our game, our specific client, this could actually work out. And then, of course, it's useful to know that these things are sti do still exist, maybe in different markets, see what drives them and why do they work. So business models never die. They always go asleep, maybe go asleep in another industry, but you have to keep track of that. And that's why I say uh, at least one of, one of the people in your team should focus on this should try to track what type of business models do exist in our industry, in similar industries, and what's, why do they fail? Quite often you see a lot of these experiments failing in the end. I have a, a, a several of examples with me. You have to understand why they do that. And of course, uh, look at similar industries, perhaps you know what type of industry you need to look for. You can't uh, dive in every possible industry, you have to understand your own mechanics in your own industry, and then you have to know what type of other, other, other industries do exist. What can I uh, learn from them? To do this, to actually compare different business models and to uh, play around with that, you need some kind of a, a structured format. You, you don't dive in the, in the deep just looking for industries, looking for uh, lessons on business models. You need a structured format. That's what we uh, needed. So we created one of uh, we created our own model. I said I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a designer myself, so when we were working with those uh, innovation teams of companies, we saw that they were just working with Word documents and all these things, and okay, we, we, we need to give them something more tangible. That's why we created this uh, kind of a, a game tool to actually play around with business models, to so give them something in hand, and to have some kind of a structured format to show, okay, this is where the money, here's, here's your money, you can play around with it, work with your team, and so on. So this is an, uh, just a basic example for Nef Netflix, one of our uh, brainstorm tools. And with this tool, also in digital format, you can uh, more or less sketch the whole process, the whole ecosystem of one industry. I work together with a few startups in, in the music industry. This is uh, an output of, of that. It's, it's a part of the mapping, complete mapping of the ecosystem of the music industry. And it has quite some similarities with, with your industry, the gaming industry. It's too big to explain in a, in a very short run, uh, but the key point here uh, was, okay, you have, this is a, a map where you see all the transactions, the, the key transactions that are going on within your industry, and even when talking to, the, to all the stakeholders in this industry, it was very clear that nobody really understands how their complete industry is working. If, uh, if you talk to people uh, maybe in the, from the recording studios, uh, they have no clue what's really going on with the festivals, the live performances. They're just in the beginning of the process, then the band goes on, uh, do some recordings later on, maybe small recordings, but in the end do some live performances, but it, there's no close connection, there's no direct connection with them. You're, if you look at this ecosystem, even just looking at the lines there, we clearly saw that there wasn't even a, a direct connection there. Purely from a, from a visual perspective, you could, you could already see that uh, some parts of this ecosystem are um, unlinked and that, that could create new opportunities. You could think of all sorts of new formats where live uh, studio recordings exist on a, on a festival that, and people would actually pay for that. So you see the first experiments that are actually doing this. And then you could map out these experiments on such a map, see how they make money, and then you could start thinking, okay, we're, I'm an entrepreneur myself, I make music, okay, that's part of my product, but could we actually do something in this new field? Set up our own live recordings and actually make some kind of a, a commission with that. So, okay, this is a music industry too big to explain at this moment, but there are some similarities. And um, for today, I created a, a basic uh, sm sort of a, a summary, a quick and dirty summary of the, of the gaming industry, just to give more structure. It's like a, it's a similar type of scheme where I, I've put the, um, a game startup in the middle and some key players around that. Just to so have more structure for, for this presentation so I can guide you along, know where the money is, and maybe inspire a few people that can actually, okay, why don't we do something like that? 
and not really focusing on tweaking some UX elements on our interface to actually get some money, but understanding the whole ecosystem so we might move in a different direction within our, within our industry or maybe find a, another type of partner. Not only partner with a publisher, but maybe partner with a total different client, maybe partner with another industry to actually make some money and become rich and famous in the end. Okay, focus on this, this, um, in this ecosystem is of course you. That's the, the new game startup that's in the heart of this ecosystem and all transactions go around them. In this case, we're, we're, I'm not going to detail the, 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 the contracts and the relationships between the publisher and maybe some, some developers you have and the marketing people around that. We just consider it as, a, as a, some sort of a black box. And okay, we have a game startup. And then we need to find out, okay, where is the money? And what can we actually do with it? Zooming out, there's the money. That's easy. We have the ecosystem. There are a lot of transactions going on. There's a lot of money moving within your industry, and somehow, in many cases, the people that are actually creating the game, they don't see much money. They, they only take a very small commission, or they have a hard time to actually take a, take a, a small share of that. So that's why I'm, I'm promoting to actually move in different directions, to find new partners there, and actually make a living out of it, to become more, become more entrepreneurial. Okay, let's zoom in on some specific areas. Let me see how that works out. Okay, at one, one part, I, I blurred another part of this, this industry. The most clear example, of course, to, to go straight, dive straight in, is you have some kind of, uh, we have the gamers, there's a game community. Okay, you have a gamer, you give them some sort of a game experience. We have use a, a fixed set of icons, that's why there's, it's not always the same icon. You give them a game experience somehow, and somehow you hope to, that he will give you some money. That's the most easy way uh, to do this. And what you saw before, that this game experience itself, we have a different icon for that, is actually delivered just as a product. Okay, that's a straightforward classic box uh, retail approach. But even there, if you dive in this, this uh, old model, you can see how, how are people trying to survive there. What are they doing to actually uh, keep a foot on the ground and not go bankrupt? And is there any future in this? Could we actually do something with that ourselves? So what do you see today? Uh, big players like uh, GameStop or other um, big companies, they have a hard time surviving. I think we all uh, saw that. Uh, but they try to encourage people at least, okay, come back to us, stay with us, and give us your old games. Fifteen dollars, uh, we give you a rebate. If you bring your old games, maybe ten dollar, five dollar, it depends. But okay, it's if they don't move in another industry and they they, they try to focus, uh, keep keep their focus on this type of model, they probably probably go bankrupt within a few years. We all see the movement to uh, direct streaming and so on and uh, moving boxes. I think that's uh, th this hasn't uh, that's no future, of course. If you look at Japan and Tokyo, I think in this model. Uh, they have some kind, something similar, but um, I, re I, re I, I like this approach more. And basically what they're doing is something similar, but it's more like uh, a leasing formula. Uh, there are many new games are, are popping up in this market. It's a highly populated market. And then you see uh, these stores where uh, if you have a new game, uh, you can just return it in the afternoon just to try it out. You use your box, go home, try it, play around with some friends and see if it works out. And if you don't like it, just bring it back in the evening and we give you the same amount, uh, we give you the price, uh, the value, uh, where you return your game, but the price will drop with 10% per day. So if you keep it for one day, two day, three day, you can make your cal the calculation yourself. But really, this really encourages people to actually um, try games very quickly and uh, to, to play around with that. And there are so many new games popping up still in retail stores and people, it's very crowded market there. So people are actually doing this. It's, a, uh, it's not that it's going to fade away. Uh, and people still get a, a, a good return on, on for their money. Still, it's just strength. I don't, within a few years probably this also will die. But at least it's a stronger model than uh, handing your, your old games for $10, $15, and there's a discussion node, oh, it's only $2 for this. This really encouraged to try new games, maybe go, go, go into a store every few days, and to actually uh, try new games, and in the end, buy 
50, 60 dollars for one game that you really liked. Okay, it's a game, it's a, a way of working, but not, it's just a, a matter of survival in this case, but it's a better approach in, in Japan than what you're trying to do in many other uh, stores. This was uh, the, not the same store, but it was uh, more the, the music industry. And there, as I already showed you this, you, you, it, you, you saw the similar type of models. Okay, going from jukebox, album, singles, and then, uh, boom, a lot of new examples there. And gaming you had the same arcade, maybe cartridge ditch, expansion packs, and so on. And suddenly, you have the same kind of boom in business models. In the music industry, okay, it took some time. There's a, there's a huge shift going on, but now you have uh, tens and maybe hundreds of small experiments where people try to make some, a living out of, uh, out of music or the experience around music. And the same type of evolution is actually happening right now in, in the gaming industry. It's, it's a little bit later than this one, so the good thing is you can actually learn from all these experiments and all the mistakes they made to actually do, set up your own experiments there. And that's always interesting. When you work together with clients on very new technology, very new products, and you don't have a similar industry because you're the first uh, in, a, in a market, then it becomes very hard. In your case, you have a few, a few other entertainment industries that are actually already experimenting a lot with business models, and it just um, okay, it takes some time. Doing, you have to do some research, but you can just look how do they work, what, what can I copy. So yes, okay. Um, a rise in, in business models in music industry, paper song formats, that's nice. Uh, paper subscription, that's a very interesting field. But still, if you, um, the Spotify model, is it from Sweden, Spotify? Okay, very good. You have it for three, four years already? I don't know. In Belgium, we only had it, have it for a few months. We're always lagging behind in Europe. We're the, the latest company where new innovations come to. So I had to hack myself an account with three or four countries to actually pay, uh, spend some money on this service, but I love it. Um, okay, a subscription-based service, that's, it, it has some potential, uh, maybe for gaming as well. But still, if you, um, if you, if you look around in the market, there is not, there, today there is not a, a, a Spotify for games, but I will focus on that in, in, in the afternoon. There's great potential there, but still we're lagging behind there in this industry. That's why I'm saying we're a few years uh, behind the other industries. So the first experiments in this market, you can just look at it in the current industry. Then, of course, maybe the next step in, in music, there are a lot of experiments, is crowdfunding models. And also understand, uh, this is a Belgian example on uh, crowdfunding in, in, the, in the music industry. But People just say, okay, we want to do something with crowdfunding to get some budget. But yet, if you talk to them, you understand that they don't really under, uh, have a notion on why some crowdfunding models are working and why some projects are failing. So I'll talk some more about this in, in the afternoon. But it's not just, okay, well, I do some crowdfunding and magic happens and then money is coming in. You have to really understand what drives uh, people to actually to, to, to pay for you, to uh, what type of rewards do you give and how to build this up. So crowdfunding, a very interesting um, approach. But okay, back to the, back to the scheme. Um, when you have this ecosystem, uh, one part, of course, is the, the classic retail box model, which is, is going out of business, and maybe for some specific niche, you can find a good way to actually deliver boxes. But okay, that's old way. Then there's this very exciting field today, um, I just general name, in-game sales, uh, working where you could actually uh, sell virtual goods or downloadable content and uh, more things like that, where people are paying via a micro payment. And there's this other field uh, where people are just trying to find a way, okay, we do something ad-based, uh, sell exposure, we get some money for that in return. But even there, going, uh, going ad-based, there are a lot of mistakes that our people are making. It's not just doing something with ads. A few uh, Few approaches could work, but most of the time it's it's only uh, a, a, I say it a, a, a fraction of income that would uh, come in. So okay, let's just start with an with a few ad-based ideas and uh, why I think in some cases it could work, and why most often it it fails today or still not reaches expectation. Uh, I think ads can add a lot of value to your game, 
but only in very specific cases. If you do it in a very good integrated way, and it even can improve the realism in your game. There are a lot of games where people in a normal context, if you go to sports games or to other simulation games or other things, uh, in a normal situation, in real life, people see these ads as well. There are a lot of billboards in games and so on. So by adding the same type of styling and, and not coming up with bogus names, but using real brand names, it even adds um, realism to your game. People feel more connected with the game. Look, this is the real stuff I'm, I'm using. And on the other hand, you're, you can, of course, sell this ad space and maybe personalize it depending on the profile of the user and so on. So these are very good examples. Not every game has this opportunity, but if your game has some link where you could actually integrate a brand on a, on a realistic way, then it works. But quite often, games uh, miss it. Games like The Sims did it pretty well, where uh, they, they make custom designs together with big brands. And of course, for some games it works, but for uh, most of the time, it, it's, um, it feels quite artificial. You can't, if once people are, uh, once users are seeing this, that you're actually um, playing around with this and you don't understand why uh, it, it, it adds some value, people will just uh, yeah, try to block your game and they, they will stop with it. For me, this is a very bad example. Draw something, the uh, iPhone and iPad, I think also an iPad application. Um, it's kind of a Pictionary, I think most of you already saw it, of course, maybe played around with it. But they, they tried to, at least one of their monetizing strategies is actually let people draw, bra draw brands. Like, uh, you, okay, draw me some Doritos, draw me some KFC. Uh, that's maybe nice for, for one time, but if you, eight times in a row, you need to draw Google. How do you draw Google? And you just try to sketch the logo or maybe some colors there. Uh, but it feels quite artificial, and people really feel, okay, I'm, 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 the, I'm being... Are being sold here. If you just try, try to sell me something, it, it's it's too obvious, and it will uh, most of the time it will hit hit them in the face. It is is this is not the way to actually do it. If you're a very big brand, you do it for a very short time, and you go on the hype like this, you probably can make some money with it, but it's not a sustainable strategy to go in in this direction. If you compare it with similar industries or similar tools that that try to do the same thing, uh, you have things like this. Um, solve Media, and Solve Media tried to brand the complex CAPTCHA codes you see on many websites. Instead of uh, typing these strange words uh, and actually helping the translation of old books, which quite often th th that's the case, you uh, just need to type a uh, commercial message or you need to type the, the brand name of a company. But people are just feel, okay, I'm, I'm being tricked here, this is too obvious, this is in my face, and people don't like this. It might be good for a very short time, maybe if to do it once, that's nice, but when you're in a game, you want to engage people, you want uh, some kind of recurring income stream, people need to work, to, uh, or at least play your game for a very long time, and if every time they need to play around with a real brand name, of course they will, it, will, it will not amaze them, quite often it will frustrate them and they will just leave your game and you will have no money in the end. So it's nice for a one, one time of campaign maybe, but not to bake in, to build in your business model and to actually hope that this will generate a lot of money. So no, I don't, I don't like this approach. You see a lot of experiments in this field. Again, another uh, bad example. Uh, there are a lot of services today that actually uh, pay people or give uh, very direct incentives if you watch an ad. So, f okay, if you see this ad, uh, we'll just pay you for that. But okay, at, at first, uh, but it's not uh, quite often. It's not uh, linked to the to the game itself. Um, okay, uh, y there will be a niche that that will go to hundreds of these ads. And even in the early days of the internet, you saw a lot of portals where people could just click through banners uh, or get a lot of email messages in their in their inbox. And when they click on it, every time they get one or two cents. But that's just artificial, and it will will not last, of course. If you try to push this into a game, it's completely against the, the game experience itself. So I don't see any future in these kind of services that uh, are trying to pay people up front to watch maybe 10 ads after, after one session. This is a completely, um, they, I think they, they completely missed the point. Is anybody experimenting with this type of, of tools before I offend somebody? 
Okay, but I, I hate these things and, and I really don't try to work with those kind of services. There are some s small differences with other services, and in, in that case, I think there is a future if you do it if you do it well. If you make a good connection, okay, you have your, your, your gaming and you give a game experience to one client, then there's the advertiser on the other side. If you find a really good uh, link between those two parties, not just paying you, you uh, uh, two cents or five cents, whatever, to to play your game, but actually find a very good reason why if you maybe execute uh, uh, progress in game or um, uh, unlock another achievement, in that case that you could get a reward from an advertiser, then it, then it could work. One of the, um, the better services for me, at least still it's an ongoing experiment, it's, it's an industry that's moving every few months very rapidly, but uh, Keep, if I am say that correctly, Keep, um, they try to offer such a service where uh, if you actually do some progress in the game, and really, like, like with the Sims game, you could say, okay, if I place a new fridge in the game, and maybe in the fridge there's some Coke, and if I do something useful with that fridge, I might get a coupon or uh, I, I will get a Coke delivered to my house or maybe a pizza or something else. But it should be very uh, related to the things that are, that are doing in-game. Not uh, giving you a holiday ad, uh, a holiday offer when you're driving in a race game, it, it, there's no connection there. If you offer a reward, linked to the experience of your game, then it should, could work. And Keep is doing the service themselves, but it might be that you as a, as a company, if you develop a new game, put this type of strategy just within your, your, uh, your business model itself. That you're actually designing a game with the option, there's some kind of a backend to some advertisers, and on a one-on-one -on -one basis you try to negotiate some good rewards there. And of course you take commission on that, or other ways to, to monetize. This for me is a, a better approach if you go for the advertising model, this is one way to go forward. Okay, then there's a whole other field here. You offer the game, and then somehow, somewhere, you let people pay a micropayment and they get something back. It could be virtual goods, downloadable content, or other things. Okay, there are many options there, and one of the important things to know if, if you sell games or any other product, you need to understand what motivates people to actually pay you. And I think tomorrow we're going to talk more about psychology. That's what I, I learned already. Uh, that's a very exciting topic. Because uh, if you, once you understand how people um, make decisions, most of the time in, on a very emotional basis, then you know how to trick them sometimes. Maybe not really trick them, but actually push them a little bit forward so, so they actually are, are starting to pay you. And you want to make money, so... Uh, stop being an artist, start to be more commercial. You actually, want, you want money, so you need to push people towards this, the card or the payment option, and actually make a living for yourself. So what drives people to actually spend money in your game? If you look at all those games, there are uh, many examples. And the key reason, first of all, is that, okay, we split it up. Uh, most of the time, people are just using credits. And why does it work? Because it's not, it's not money to them. That's, of course, the first reason you're already halfway. Once you start pushing people, switch, just switch their $10 to 10 uh, points. It's the same type of value. You don't need to, to play around with new numbers. When people think it's not real money, they will just spend it. If you have in, I think it must be the same here, but in Belgium, a lot of um, um, people get a lot of uh, checks via their employer. Uh, eco checks, uh, working checks, whatever, all sorts of checks. And if you look how, how people are spending these type of checks, it has the same monetary value. It's just five euro twenty, whatever, just printed on. But people will just throw with it because it's, yeah, it doesn't feel like money. Uh, if you see how people are spending their PayPal accounts, okay, it's real money still. It's not even points or stars or whatever. But people are just paying. Oh, it's just my PayPal account. Doesn't matter. Fifty euro gone of my PayPal, whatever. So push people halfway. That's the first thing. And the more. The, the bigger the difference you make between real money and your game money or other money, the more money you can make yourself. That's the first step, of course. If you're just asking for real money, uh, try to make uh, maybe create some new type of coins or currency within your game. And that's the first step. That's why I'm introducing these new type of credits icons here. Okay. That's, that's one thing. But then, why do people pay? There are... Okay, there are just a, s a summary, and some, some are, some are uh, linked to each other. 
but you need to understand all these, these principles. And there are some uh, small differences there as well. If you understand what drives people, then you can ask money for that. I'll run over a few, uh, few uh, examples. The, most, the thing that we see uh, most often, and that's purely baked in the emotional, uh, the human being, um, we envy stuff of others. We like status, we're always jealous of what others have. So if there's one way in your model that you could actually um, work with some kind of a, a, a status, a feeling of status or a reputation there, you can actually um, ask money for that. If, if you have uh, one type of clothing or a free avatar, okay, you could, you could design it for once, but you can even change the color 20 times and then suddenly you have 20 types of clothes and still people will, will, will buy that if it makes them more unique and if they can show off to us, look, I, I spend so much uh, money on this. So, uh, we did a lot of studies on, on, on criminal business models. That's another uh, focus, but if you look at criminals, they're quite creative, and they really understand what drives people to spend a lot of money, if you look at all these fraudulent business models. And there, it's, it's the same type of approach. If, uh, if you push people towards a, a sort of a, a model where people can pay for status, then they will actually spend a lot of money. We saw examples where people are, were, were paying up to 60% of the real price of a Lamborghini for a fake Lamborghini, so with an old, old engine and with, with bad tires and everything, but it looked the same. It was the same type of car from an auto, so, but with foam and everything, they just created a similar type of Lamborghini car with, with bad tires, bad engine, bad interior, but the outside was the same. And people still valued this car, 60% of the real price, of a car and we're paying for that purely for the status. So they could drive around in the city, look, I have this very expensive car, but I can't afford it. But okay, it doesn't matter, people don't know it's not a real Lamborghini and I'm just paying tons of money for that. So I do a lot of experiments with that, see what drives your, your user, how can you push them towards this type of uh, jealousy feeling and uh, how, let, let them brag and, and so on. To fit in exclusivity and uh, show commitment, and a few things again that are related. Uh, let's say that the, the first round where people are, are spending money, it's it's to feel unique, to have their status. Okay, that a few people are buying, let's say, a new sword in a game. Um, that's nice because they, they, okay, look, I'm more powerful than you. Okay, that's nice, and I'm, I'm more cooler than you. But after a while, everybody has this, and you're the only one that that doesn't. And then suddenly, you also want to pay. So we have different type of segments. Uh, so you need to, to measure that, and if you see that some people are just not buying this thing, but in the end, 80% of the other users already ha have that type of clothing, weapon, whatever, try to push them to actually sh look, you're the last one in the group, or make it really obvious that you're the last one that didn't buy it, and quite often say, okay, with a small discount, I, I will just buy it myself, uh, and they will just fit in again. Um, exclusivity. Of course, if you have a one-time of unique piece, that always works. There are people quite sensitive to that. Uh, then again, they can brag with that. And show commitment. That's a, that's a very strong one. Show commitment, example from, uh, from guilds and clans, uh, where people are actually paying to join the guild by paying a very expensive good. Only people with this specific equipment can join our guild. And that's very powerful. Once, once you have that in place, that gamers uh, are, are selecting each other based on the amount of money they're spending in your game, then you can make a lot of money. But it's not easy to create that, but if you see the first things are, are, are popping up in that, that field, you could actually encourage people to actually, look, there's this guild structure and uh, maybe encourage that a little bit. So you, you see in this case, maybe people that are paying for this specific cape, in the end, the guild, everybody needs to have the same cape to show them that they are fitting in. And on the other hand, that they are committed, that maybe amateur players, they won't spend so much money on this exclusive cape. So that you can actually uh, try to bake it in in your model and then suddenly people are pushing each other to spend more money in the game and you don't need to do anything in the end. It's hard to do, but if, if you get there, a quite successful strategy you see uh, quite often. Okay, to beat friends, that's always interesting. If you find a way, that people actually can see how much better they are than their closest friends, and not just anybody, not just a general leaderboard, but they find a way that they can compare themselves to others. 
You see that with, uh, with parents, they always try to compare their child with the child of their neighbors. Look, my kid is so much smarter. No, no, mine can run faster. And they always look for a way to show, okay, I'm better than you. So you want to make it visible. If you don't offer a way, just a general uh, top 100, top 10, whatever, if it's not linked to the direct social contact, it doesn't work. People, do, okay, it doesn't matter that maybe some kind of strange Korean kid is so much better than me, but if my direct neighbor is so much better, I, I will work on that. I will I'll make sure that I'm on the top of that list and I sh I'm, I'm so much better. And time, that's another thing. You can do it once, but let's say you reset the timer every three days, every five days, maybe every few weeks, and then, uh, okay, you're on top of the list, and after week three, everything is being reset, or there's some kind of a function that you need to come back every few days to actually keep your position there. Then again, you have another monetizing strategy. So if you ask money to actually be here or have some credits that people need to spend to actually uh, level up in the game, but after a few weeks, they need to pay again to actually keep their status or keep their level, then you're doing it pretty well. You become some sort of a, um, in Belgium we would say, commercial whore, like we say. But they don't know the Swedish word for that. Um, but okay, you need to make money. So you need to push people, uh, take away their status, but uh, uh, communicate it pretty well. And after a few days, ask for more money to actually, again, uh, beat your closest neighbor or your closest friend. You have, it's not really tricking them. If you do communicate in a good way, people understand that games need to make money. And okay, they don't have to spend money. It's their choice. Always try to offer different options. One of, one of the options is paid, so actually to uh, speed up this process. Some other things. Um, excitement. Excitement, maybe not, not the best term, but um, if you see why people pay um, uh, lottery tickets, it's, it's not purely for the rational chance to actually win a lot of money. It's purely for going to the store, having this moment of excitement to, to scratch the lottery, uh, maybe sit together with a few friends, look, um, can I win something, and so on. It's more about the, the, the experience around this, um, the buying of the lottery ticket and actually looking up the numbers and so on. And, and uh, it's not in, in relationship with the, the direct economical value. How they implement it in games today is with all those kind of mystery crates. You see it in many games already, mystery crates. It's one of the big cash cows already in this field. Uh, it started as a few experiments in a few games, but it it's, has proven already that it's, it's, if, if implemented well, it brings in a lot of money. Just because people, uh, okay, I have this mystery box, I can buy it, I can spend money for a mystery box. And there, you know, always know that there's, there are four guns in there and one of them could be one of the most exclusive guns in the game, and it's for that moment people are doing that. And then again, they buy a new box and a new box and a new box. Of course, you can't trick them. If people never um, get something, you only give them uh, lousy stuff, and so on, it will not work. But it's knowing that, that you could win, and maybe show people, look, this guy has this very big gun in game, and he got it through one of the exclusive mystery boxes, and you need to pay for that gun only via buying a mystery box. So in the end, they buy 10 mystery boxes to have this a chance on this very exclusive gun or a piece of equipment within the game. Mystery boxes are one of the key things to focus on. I'd say if, if, you, if you, in your game, find a way to introduce mystery boxes, I think you, you should definitely do that. But, but don't, don't fool people but because they will, you will face a huge backlash. But it's a, it's a huge cash cow and it doesn't cost you anything. You have to just create one box, that's, that's all. To feel lucky and collections. Of course, collections. Um, it's a combination of different things, but if you show people that there are series and they, by the end, okay, you, you can uh, collect them and the last two pieces, or you buy 20 mystery boxes or you spend a lot of cash just to buy the last two pieces, some people will just do that. Instead of going to the hassle of not ex buying extra stuff, just completing their set. This is, people, for some reason, we don't like incompleteness, if that's a word, but we want to... Uh, the complete set always. We want to show that we have everything. If there's one piece left in this puzzle, people are getting crazy. You know, where's this last piece? I want it. People, it's, it's something, again, that we feel as a human being, things need to be complete. There should be a pattern and so on. So if one field open, we just buy that last piece to show, look, look what, I, what I've done. And to feel lucky, yeah, of course, that's related to the, to the mystery crates. Um, a very, very good thing. Automation, convenience, shortcuts, again, um, that's, that's a, it's a difficult balance. You need to experiment with that. Um, 
a lot of games just try to introduce some frustrations by making the game in the end unplayable in the hope that some people will just pay again to actually have some fun with the game. That's not the way to go forward. You need to have a very good game, not, don't frustrate people, but show them just a few options to actually speed up their process. Um, like, uh, uh, I think in World of Warcraft, I'm not a die-hard gamer, but you could actually spawn instantly instead of uh, waiting a few minutes and so on, or, or uh, instead of walking again two kilometers to a virtual map, you can just pop up at the location you, you died, and so on. So just some sort of a shortcut. Also, in so many Facebook games, you need to wait for a few minutes to, or a few hours, a few days sometimes to actually um, build a factory or other things. If you could speed that up, or improve the usability sometimes with a few clicks and of offer that as a good option, then you could actually make tons of money. Uh, this is an example from, um, I, I lost the name, Kickflex? No, I'm missing. So, there is a gamer in the room. What is the name of the game? War Commander? No gamers in the room? That's pity. Um, Okay, well, I, I think the name was Kickflex, but okay, it doesn't matter. What, it, what does, uh, is important is, this, um, of course, you have the big uh, Zynga company in Facebook, but this, let's say, if, if Zynga has an has a average revenue per user per day between 4 and 10 cents, these three games of this company sometimes have an average revenue per day up to 80 cents per day. They only have three games on Facebook. Um, and this is one of them. But they, they really tweaked their experience that people are spending so much more money in contrast with other games. They have a, a smaller user base, but it, uh, Facebook is keeping a very close eye on these type of platforms because they really understand how to monetize their users. 20 times more than, than Zynga does. Zynga has more the volume. They have a smaller platform, but actually know how to monetize them. And you see that at every, uh, at every point of their interface, they have these uh, uh, buying options, uh, smoothly blended into the game, you could just wait for it, uh, construction completeness or some extra features, or you can just buy it. And at every moment in their game, their interface is just designed to actually convince people you can buy something. And not frustrate people, because you can just ignore it and just continue your game. But if you do it pretty well, you're getting a lot of cash, and uh, in the end, they show how to convert them. Um, I will look up the name and share it on Twitter, because uh, it's a very good case. Another example. There, there, are more, there are more, of course, but understanding these emotions um, will bring some money. So you have to dive into some psychology there, maybe re read some um, uh, consumer behavioral economics and, and so on. There, there, you can learn from other industries uh, at this point as well. Revenge. This has proven to be uh, a key emotion why people spend tons of cash. Revenge. In this game, Mafia Wars, to give one example, uh, you have people with different powers and different levels. And if one of the most powerful people would kill you or, or take away some pieces and, and you, you lose a lot of stuff, but you, you're not uh, strong enough to actually kill that other guy, you feel, okay, I want revenge, but how? Okay, no, don't worry, we have some sort of a hit list system where other more powerful users can just take out this guy, but you have to pay them for that. And that's a nice thing, because people, they, they might have some cash, but their uh, player is not strong enough. Okay, I'll spend some cash on this. Who wants it? And in the end, somebody else will kill that guy in the game. You'll say, okay, nice, got him back. Um, and the, the company behind it takes 20% of your credits. So at first, they sell you credits. Then they give uh, most of the credits to another player, and the company takes 20% uh, out of the circulation. So in the end, somebody has to uh, repay or rebuy more credits. And uh, I saw this in one of the one other presentation, and there one guy spends more than three thousand dollars to actually kill somebody else on this hit list system, just showing that revenge is a very deep and strong emotion. And if you really think you had a, you built for weeks on a huge base or whatever, and somebody else comes over, kills it overnight, you're f quite frustrated. And at that specific moment, when you offer them, you look, oh, just take your credit card. We'll take care of that. You'll be out in a few hours. People just spend their money. So revenge is a very good, a very good tool. To feel powerful, not maybe not to be powerful, but just to feel powerful. If they think, okay, I'm quite strong, I could kill anybody, but I'm friendly today. That's nice. Just show them that they're powerful. If they think they have more control, and so on. Um, you always have to know the know the feeling, but uh, know the difference between perception and the 
uh, and reality. If you like things with, with status and um, people love to brag, look, this is what I have, this is all my, my stuff. If they think that people are seeing that, that's good enough. It might be that nobody cares, but if, they, if they're feeling that somebody cares, that's enough, that's why they're paying. If you look at Facebook for the moment, uh, we all share stuff, or I think most people, we, sh we share stuff on Facebook because we think that our friends are seeing this. Uh, due to the high traffic and the type of interface and the selection, there are some research that now shows that uh, only 10 to 20% of your status messages and things are actually being seen by your whole friends. So only, only a very tiny fraction of things that you put on Facebook are actually being seen uh, by most people on, that are on your friend list. But that's not, that doesn't matter because people are actually putting a lot of stuff on there because they know, or at least they have the feeling that somebody's seeing that. And now they're introducing this new feature last week or two weeks ago. They're experimenting where you could actually pay as a user to have your uh, message actually seen by more users. It's a new experiment they're doing. Uh, so you now can pay Facebook to actually make sure that your Facebook message is, is more clear to more friends. And then, of course, there's a difference because people start realizing if this really is being placed, suddenly everybody starts to realize, look, I, I put this on Facebook, but it might be that only 20 of my closest friends see this, but the 200 other friends uh, never saw this picture. Okay, I might pay for that. So actually, people see what my personal life story is all about. Very exciting. Okay. So the perception and, and reality. In gaming, there's this concept of whales. I don't know if you're... Is it in education or are you familiar with, with the term? I think it's a very, very strong concept. Um, the, the term of whales was, was kind of new to me in the gaming industry. There are other terms in other industries. We are also looking, at now if we do masterclass or, or, or projects with clients, let's say we, if, if, if we set our price in, 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 in comparison with our direct competition, and we just play around with that. But we're already thinking, could we maybe instead of asking a few hundreds of euro, asking thousands of euro, ten thousands of euro for a few hours to spend with a client. And why would actually somebody pay thousands or ten thousands of euro for maybe a few minutes with a concept of ours? We don't know yet. But there, are, there might be a very specific niche in there that is actually willing to spend tons of money. That's what they call whales. People that for some reason are so excited about your game or your service, if you give them the option to spend your money, that they will actually do that in the end. And you might make, you make so much more money by these few people in contrast with the 50, 80 or 90% of other people. But you can do it very wrongly as well. And um, go, going back to this system where uh, people are paying for extra clothing or extra status and so on, there was this um, Dutch example. It's not this screenshot, but it's similar, where they gave uh, in some sort of a, a mini game towards young kids. They gave them clothing. Um, Thanks, welcome in the game. Here are some clothes. And then they can walk around with that. And after two weeks, look, you must imagine uh, girls of six years old, they're playing around. And after two weeks, there's this message. OK, it's very nice, but we will switch you back to this, to this old avatar, and the classic avatar. And you, you will lose all your fancy stuff. But don't worry. Uh, there's a mobile phone number and an SMS code. And if you just pay us uh, two euro, or, but that's not very clear to them, then we'll just uh, give it back to you. So you give kids some things, then you take it, take it back. It's a very lucrative strategy if you want to make money. Uh, but there was quite some discussion in the Netherlands because these, these uh, young girls, even six years old, seven years old, they have access to mobile phones. They will just spend a lot of money to actually keep their clothing alive, let's say. Um, but there was a huge debate, of course, and this uh, platform had to kill this feature, of course. So you, you should allow people to spend tons of money, but there's some ethical border that you can't cross, like young children and everything. But if you, you're targeting adults and they have a lot of money and they're, you're really open about the communication, do you know you're spending thousands of euros already? Yeah, that's fine. I'm happy with that. Allow them to do so. There are many games where you don't... Um, we just can't uh, spend more money. You, you, you bought all the different tools, you bought all different maps and add-ons, and then if you have your die-hard fans, many games don't have an option to actually spend more. And that's a pity, of course, because you want some money, so give, at least give them the option to spend more. For every game, that's different, but you really need to focus what should that be in my specific industry. 
an, ähm, an Singa. This is fish fill. An Singa, they have this concept, what they, what they call uh, grind, spam, or pay. Um, it, I love this concept. I will introduce that to the business world as well. Uh, grind, spam, pay just means, okay, at first, if in this, this case, if you want an, a special new fish or, or maybe some other things, you can first grind, maybe uh, work on that for 20 days or wait, wait for it, and after 20 days, if you do this and this and get, have so many points, you can have this new fish. Very nice, nice fish. But you can also spam, and uh, you can invite all your friends on Facebook, and uh, maybe uh, send some mailings, and ask other people to join to, to speed up the process. That's the second step. So you first give the, you, all, you present the three options to the, to the user, but in the beginning they will just try to grind first, and then after a few days they say, no, no, I really want this. I will just mail my closest friends and, and spam my Facebook wall and everything, but even then, Nobody cares anymore and just will start to block you on Facebook and then you say okay, that's that's getting uncomfortable uh, And in the end they will just uh, Go for for pay and uh, maybe to finish up the last uh, few points or whatever They will just just pay to complete that and the company behind Singa they really understand the Company behind Fishville they really understand uh, At which stage users are so if they know that they already send out maybe tens of mails to their friends But nobody's replying they know there's this urge, okay, I really want this, but it's not working out, and then with a small discount, you can just pay and instantly you have it. And, and so they really target the, the, the stage where people are in to actually convince people to take next step. It might take a few extra days, but in the end, people will just pay to have these extra things. So know this concept pretty well. Experiment with that. Uh, I think I, I like the idea of a grind, spam, pay. You don't force people to pay, you just show them some different options that are not that convenient. In the end, they will just pay to uh, actually have those things. And see how, how you can uh, play around with that. Okay, I think this is the last example for um, these things. I already talked about bragging, but helping peers and gifts is another very strong, strong thing. If you're in a game, and there are a few uh, very wealthy players, they already have everything, um, make sure that they can spend some more money to actually to pay stuff for others. That's the next step. It's a very easy thing to do if you have some kind of a collection system and in the end you don't know how, what can I ask else to actually pay people. Just allow them to, to, to pay for others. And if you do that in open, that, that people can see, look, this guy is, is paying for the others. That gives them a lot of, a lot of personal status. Um, if it's very open, look, thanks guy, uh, the whole clan now has this new weapon because this very wealthy guy just paid for everybody a new crate and, and, and whatever. That, and, and again, you're playing on this, this social layer, this emotional layer of a few people. So it's a very easy thing to get more money. And of course, gifts. Gifts can be, okay, between friends, but if gifts in a more dating context, uh, if you go towards uh, flirting and everything, then people spend tons of money just, I don't know why, for virtual flowers and everything, but some... For some people it works, they're quite happy with that, and ask some money for that. Gifts, and again, it's the same thing, allow people to spend more, to give, to give uh, more to others, and to actually brag, to brag, look, I'm so wealthy, I can afford to spend tons of money in your game, and make that very public, and make that very open to, to show them. That's not the case. So, um, I have a few minutes left. I will just... Um, focus on a few other areas where peop other people are making, uh, at least making some money for the same, with the same type of uh, client base. So maybe you're not making money, uh, but in, in this area, okay, you, you offer them a gaming experience, but they don't pay you, maybe you don't have advertising, but even then, you sometimes see that others are finding a way to actually uh, make users pay. It could be that and, and here are hundreds of examples where people are just uh, spending tons of money on a better gaming mouse or another tool that will help them, uh, some guidance, some personal stuff, maybe some, some merchandising or other gimmicks. So other people are actually making a lot of money. And then you can start thinking, why don't we offer this ourselves? Why don't we offer basic tools, basic servers, basic upgrades? This, these are the low-hanging fruits. They're quite obvious in many cases. If you see, okay, of course, um, but... Still, it's quite strange that so many young companies don't experiment with that. That they see that their gamers, their users are paying others to improve their gaming experience. 
but they're not offering that themselves. Very basic stuff, I think that that's the basics. Everybody should have at least something like that of some kind of a basic merchandising with all the online tools and everything, even when basic indie games like this, um, they have some kind of a committed fan base where people are, are, are paying for tattoos, uh, paying for merchandise or t-shirts. It's very basic stuff, but then you think, why don't we have that? If you're looking for basic cash, you, you don't, maybe it's just cover the few, first few, few, uh, few months or few years, it will bring in some extra bucks. And in the end, it, it will help your um, um, social status of your gamers and it will sh show to each other, look, we're connected, we're playing the same game and, and you can actually monetize that uh, later on. Another good case here is where you see there's a good mix between the real world and more or less online or the digital world. Uh, in, in Japan, you see this, this type of cases where you can only level up in a game or find more information to complete the, the puzzle or the, the riddle you're trying to solve by actually buying real comic books. So a part of the story will just continue and people will go to these manga stores every few days to buy the new type of comic and then they, they learn about the new character and with this information they can actually uh, level up within the game. So this, the game itself might be free or nearly free but they make some commission on uh, real world objects there to actually make uh, at least makes make some money. And also, I, I like the approach, but a mix between real world and, and the digital world. If you manage to do this, I, I already saw one of them playing around with these blocks. In a block, I don't have any idea what it does, but in that machine, you need to put in blocks. I need to play around with that. But if you could actually sell those blocks or work together with a big brand to actually produce those blocks and you, to take a commission on those blocks, that could be interesting. It also makes your, um, your, your game more, more tangible. So I re really like this, this field. So um, just before going to, to lunch, a few other fields. And I'll, um, this is where I think that the future is and where you should, should focus on if you want to, to make more money. First, uh, act, act as a tool. And there might be some new parties coming into your ecosystem. Um, and I think we saw this example already where Folded is a great way to go forward where you get, it's not just a game, but in the end you're selling some sort of a tool. You know fold it, but this is another example um, where I think that they, they made a very good case. Uh, Roamler, it's some sort of a game, a real world game, where people can uh, receive challenges on their mobile phone. You're walking, you're walking around in Amsterdam and suddenly you get a message, look, are you in for a game? The first one to get to this street and take a picture of a, a pint gets, I don't know, 20 credits and uh, 20 points or I will level up in the game. So you, you create a, some sort of a real life uh, a quest challenge. It's, it's a game on your mobile phone, making use of the, of the technology and the sensors, the location-based services and so on. But once you get there, okay, you need to uh, maybe take a few pictures of a specific store and so on. But it's very exciting because you can see people running maybe or you can compete against others. So that's a challenge. That's a very nice game concept itself. But in the end, they're offering a tool and the, the, their business model is completely built uh, as a, a marketing agency tool. So if you're, uh, let's say, the, you're, 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 you're selling beer and you want to know, you have so many places in between, you want to know how beer is being served in, in the bars. You can uh, buy expensive marketing agencies to go out and to look for that. Or you can just hire the audience of Romler, give them a challenge and let them take 50 pictures of different pints during the day on sp for sp specific bars to check, look, how are these pints being served? Is this, is this how that we like it to do? So, uh, in Romler just creates a game on one hand, but on the other hand, they create a complete backend towards big agencies and by making some sort of a marketing tool. And that's where the big, big money is for them. That's pretty smart. You could create a game for fun, or you could just start when, when designing a game upfront, think, okay, how can we monetize this? Can we sell our service, our audience, to another party? And that's a very good example for me. Uh, it's a starting point, but at, at it's one of the first experiments in this field. I really like this uh, approach. This is, again, uh, for me, it's like an open door, but still, why don't, don't you do it in, in games? I don't know. Just sell real goods instead of selling advertising. Just make it possible to actually buy goods. It, it's kind of straightforward. Um, Pinterest showed that a lot of people care um, that people are collecting all this stuff and that then they had this implementation 
where people could actually link to an affiliate and there they could actually buy the stuff they were liking already. It's kind of obvious, but still not many games offer the opportunity, instead of just showing an ad, to buy a real product within the game. Not a virtual product, but a real product, maybe delivered at home, and so on. There are a lot of opportunities there. To show one example of a Belgium agency, a developer, also an, an living in the same city, uh, they offer games, they make games to other, to other companies, they, they make uh, iPhone applications, and so on. And for some of them, uh, they will say, okay, we make the application or the game for free, but for any transaction that goes in the game with your brand, let's say they created some sort of a, a game for a music festival, and there's, it, it's, it's linked with one of the big supermarkets, for, and then on the festival, there's this uh, camping store with the supermarket, so you can buy a tent over there and extra stuff you might need on a, on a festival. But they say, okay, we'll give you the game, and anybody that comes in with it via the app and actually buys something on, in that store or makes a reservation, we get a commission on that. So that they, they really, up front, they start thinking we're not just creating a festival application. Up front, they start thinking, okay, what can we do with it? How can we monetize this? So we make an agreement to, to on the, all the e-commerce transactions or the real transactions that take place in the offline world and earn on that. Still in experimental phase, but this is the way to go forward, I think, in, in this field. There are a lot of games that actually, where you could actually sell real stuff and you should make money with that. Not uh, sending it with an ad to other parties. And I think to conclude, let me see. Yeah, I'll to conclude. A last field, it's a hot area today. Um, do something with gambling, betting, things like that. People spend tons of money on gambling and betting. Um, there are huge piles of cash there, and you want a share. I think that's quite obvious. But of course, you know, how to do this? You don't want to be the, like say, the commercial whore there. You need to play around with that. But of course, Facebook is, is working on the first uh, things where you, people can play for real money in casino games. All, all our games are, are stepping into this field. It's, it's different, it's a difficult balance. You don't want an in-your-face approach, but if people start not playing for the better gun, but they can actually make 500 euro within the game and actually spend a little bit more for that, that's a good opportunity for you to, to make some cash. I will uh, elaborate more on this, on the, the gambling part and some failures uh, that existed already in, in different industries, so you can actually make use of that uh, later on. I want to conclude here, and I wish you a lot of luck to actually make tons of money in the future. Thank you very much.